The mythology goes something like this. Most of the rules of harmony that we use today coalesced around the turn of the 20th century. And yet, the kind of music that they described ceased to be written at that time. Just as the rules of harmony were unveiled, composers threw them out. Like most myths, this one is true up until a point. The narrative that we teach in music history is driven by innovation, and it is true that innovative composers were throwing off the shackles of common practice harmony around 1900. But how many composers were actually innovators? How much music that people actually listened to was innovative? I suggest looking at the harmonies of a popular piece just to find out. Let's take a look at The Entertainer from 1902 by Scott Joplin. This is a charming piece, but its harmonic language is very conventional. These harmonies could have been written any time a century or two earlier. They are exactly the kind of music that conventional harmonic theory is meant to describe. I remember being in music theory class in the 1970s, and my teacher claimed that much recent music was still based on common practice chord progressions. This wasn't really true of the recent concert music, jazz, and rock and roll that I was familiar with. I didn't know what he was talking about. At this free move, I think I know what he was talking about. When I was a kid, the Rodgers and Hammerstein musical, The Sound of Music, was made into a movie, and it was a huge hit, and it was accompanied by common practice harmony. So common practice harmony was still around in things like Broadway musicals. The songs from The Sound of Music are still under copyright, but here's a Richard Rodgers song that isn't, Mountain Greenery. Look at its harmonies. They are as conventional as any in the 19th century. When we talk about 20th century harmony, chord progressions like those of mountain greenery are not what we mean. We are referring to chord progressions that violate the rules of the common practice. In a previous video, we looked at modal harmony. Much music in the early 20th century contains such harmony. Let's expand the idea of modal harmony to include harmonization outside the seven diatonic modes. Guidelines for harmonizing modal music are fairly loose but they do include a rule of thumb that requires some melody note be a part of the chord. For example, if we want to harmonize a whole tone scale, we would pick a chord that contains a prominent note in the melody, in our example maybe a C. If we use the C as the root of the chord, we can create a triad from the notes of the whole tone scale. This produces a C augmented triad. At a certain point, the pitches of the scale clash with that chord, so we need to choose a second chord to harmonize those notes, say D augmented. We might want to go back to the first chord, C augmented, for the last note of the scale. The whole tone scale is somewhat bereft of harmonic variety. In fact, it really only contains two chords, both of which are augmented, in this case C augmented and D augmented. This lack of harmonic variety can get tiresome very quickly. Let's give the harmonic progression more variety by using all major chords. The only stipulation here is that you should use a note from the melody as a part of the chord. To do this, you will have to change chords more often than in the previous example. To my ear, this method makes a reasonable harmonic accompaniment for the scale. Notice that there is little concern over the root movements of the chords. This is because this kind of music is structured by the melody, the scale. The chords are merely used for color and support. Let's look at a Lydian dominant scale. This scale is meant to fill in a dominant seventh chord with a kind of Lydian sound.
it too can be harmonized by picking major chords that contain the pitches of the scale. Unlike the whole tone scale, the octatonic scale contains a wide variety of possible chords. Here's a harmonization using chords made up of the pitches of the octatonic scale. Like our previous examples, this scale could be harmonized with all major chords. Note that all of the harmonizations on the right side of the example contain pitches outside the scales. In conventional harmonic theory, you would need to describe the function of all of these chromatic pitches. In these examples, I'm looking for a major quality to the chords, and I want the chords to contain one of the pitches of the melody. And that's it. No explanation of the chord function is necessary, because these chords don't really have a function. 20th century harmony, unlike common practice harmony, was obsessed not with chord progression, but rather with the tone color, the quality of chords, particularly complex chords. One way to describe more complex harmonies is in terms of chord extensions. By chord extensions, I mean added thirds on top of a chord to create seventh chords, ninth chords, eleventh and thirteenths. The trick here is to make sure that the melodic material used matches the pitches of the chord. For example, a Dom 7 flat 9 was a favorite of Beethoven's. He usually used a harmonic minor scale based on the tonic of the piece to accompany the chord, because that scale contains both the raised 7th and the lowered 6th, and those are the 3rd and 9th of the chord. This matching of the melodic material with the chord becomes tricky when chromatics are added to the chord extensions. For example, a diatonic F major 13th contains all of the notes of the F major scale, so an F major scale fits it perfectly. Sharping the 11th makes a different, and many would say more pleasant sounding chord. In order not to clash with the sharp 11 of the chord, the 4th of the scale, the B flat, would need to be raised to a B natural in order to match the sharp 11th. So the previous F major scale now becomes an F Lydian scale. Complex chords can be thought of as triads with chord extensions, or they can be thought of as polychords. Polychords look like chords from different keys being used at the same time. Polychords can be thought of as the result of polytonality. In the following example, I've put the treble clef staff in D major and the bass clef staff in C mixolydian. It sounds like there are complex shifting chromatic chord extensions, but I didn't think of it that way. I merely used accidentals from D major in the upper part and C mixolydian in the lower part. This all seems very free, as if 20th century composers could just do whatever they wanted, and to some extent they could, but at a cost. Many 20th century composers sacrificed root movement in favor of more colorful chords. This limited the role that chord progressions could play in propelling the music forward. The composer Paul Hindemith noticed this, and he devised a different kind of movement that could strengthen or take the place of root movement. He called this harmonic fluctuation. The idea of harmonic fluctuation is that music feels like it's moving when it becomes more consonant or dissonant. Composers can control consonants and dissonance in order to create movement and stasis. Here's an example that I cooked up using quartal harmony, stacked fourths, one of Hindemith's favorite devices. The example begins with a unison that moves to an open fifth. This is followed by a series of quartal chords, which is followed by a chord with an added second and an added fourth, followed by an open fourth and then a triad at the cadence. The example moves from strong consonances to dissonances and back to consonances. In the mid-20th century, some of my teachers were puzzled by Hindemith's harmonies. They liked the quartal chords, but the consonances, especially the triads, bothered them. They wanted the sound of all dissonance all the time. The atonal music of the early 20th century required a different kind of harmony, a harmony that didn't move, that was static 
and constantly dissonant. If it was to be truly atonal, it could not include harmonic resting places. The example below is a harmonization of a 12-tone row. The scheme is loosely modeled after the opening of the Schoenberg Fourth String Quartet. Note that all of the chords are dissonant and that they do not include any of the pitches of the melodic group that they accompany. In fact, the chords are designed to clash with the notes of the melody. Notice that the chords are derived from the pitches of the row. The ordering of the 12 notes of the chromatic scale used as the basis for this piece. The first chord uses the last three notes of the row. The second chord uses the pitches of the third melodic trichord. The next chord comes from the first three pitches of the row, and the last chord uses pitches four through six of the row. So the chords use the pitches of the row, just not at the same time that those pitches are used in the melody. Harmonic practice in the 20th century was much more diverse than it was in the 18th and 19th centuries. Many composers simply mixed and matched techniques without much thought to the music theory behind them. This was even true in 12-tone music, where composers were concerned about constructing chords from notes of the row, but were unconcerned with root movement. 